So tell me about a couple of other documentaries that you've done or you're going to do. Well, um, you know, I sort of work in, 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 right now, there's sort of three different areas. There's um, the whole business of toxic stress with children and what um, traumatic experiences in childhood do to derail you from a healthy life, really. And this is all centered around an emerging field of epigenetics, which looks at what you're predisposed to genetically and how your environment may or may not trigger some of those things. Your environment being your experiences. And so all the research, most of it coming from, well, some of the early research coming from Dr. Zanda and, and Felitti um, out of the CDC in San Diego, um, very clearly shows that children who suffer neglect, physical, sexual, verbal abuse, um, witness violence, um, or chronically exposed to mental health, uh, there's a whole list of very unfortunate sort of things that, that children are exposed to. The more they're exposed to these things at a young age, the more likely it is they're going to suffer serious health problems in their lifetime. Um, and that correlation, it's, it's sobering in some ways, but it also points to some things you can do about it and why it's so important to protect children and to, to try to intervene. And the, the difficult thing is there's a window there between ages zero to seven where these unfortunate experiences are occurring. But the impact of those experiences are not evident yet. They're not acting out. They're not having the health issues right, yet. Right. So it's very important to try and create a safe environment for children. And it's just yet another thing we all know anyway, right. that our children are our most precious resource. So, but there's really novel things going on in terms of how to deal with that and how understanding that the, how the brain processes those experiences. Well, and it's the protection mode that kind of like locks a certain area to protect yourself from a feeling. Right. And so you kind of close that area, and as a kid, you don't even you're not even aware you've shut down on a certain area just for self you know, to help to, just to help you through life survive. And what you just described, you can see on on functioning MRIs now. You can see oh. what, how the changes in the prefrontal cortex or the changes in the amygdala or the hippocampus shifts according to these experiences. So this is a physiological thing that happens to children. And next time, I mean, we all know that part of town you drive through and you see some kids and you go, wow, boy, I hope, you know, those, those poor kids are scary. You know, they're, they're pierced, they're tattooed, the hair, they're, they're crying out, um, and you just sort of repel. But the truth is, is that Every one of those kids has a really, really unfortunate story, and what you're seeing is really the tip of an iceberg that deserves help and understanding. You know, so we're working on on a project about about this to bring more medical knowledge to what we already know with common sense. We've got to do something about this. So that's, that's the most current thing. Yeah. Good. Um, and then uh, November 25th of this year, uh, we'll air on HBO a film called Toxic Hot Seat which um, is an amazing journey for me. I started in the winter of 2012, where I was approached by a board member of the Natural Resources Defense Council. Her name's Kirby Walker. She brought some research to me about flame retardants, that they don't work, they don't prevent fires, but they pose They're very toxic. significant health risks. Right. And the question is, what are they doing there? If it's really, if that's the truth, why are they in every American piece of upholstered furniture for the most part? They get into your body and they, they, they go right into your fat cells. They, they, and then they stay there. They accumulate. Oh my gosh. So, you know, um, it's problematic and particularly hard on, on babies uh, because, uh, one, children are on the ground where the dust falls out of the upholstered furniture that has these chemicals. And two, nursing mothers, um, if, it's, if it's in their fat tissues, it comes out through breast milk. So there's, this sounds like, oh, no, not another depressing environmental issue. Oh, boy, you know, how much can we take? No, but, but it's uh, helping people be aware of what they're putting in their own environment and with their children and what the cribs are. And Yeah. I mean, it's not and just organic food anymore. It's right. the, the crib and the environment and your carpets. and. But I do see some things changing right now and it, it, 
it's exciting because when we were making this documentary, exploring the issue of why these chemicals are there, and of course it comes down to things like uh, legislative failures linked to very well-funded lobbyists on behalf of the chemical industry um, and and the usual things that go on there's a dark legacy that connects to the tobacco industry that said uh, they didn't want to make a fire safe cigarette because it's not as profitable so let's fire pray let's fireproof your world instead so oh. an, another wonderful legacy from the tobacco industry here but you know um, the good news is that at the very same time this was going down, two very important things happened. The Chicago Tribune had been looking at this issue for a year, and they released a groundbreaking um, series in, in the Tribune, exposing everything that's going on. It was so well researched um, and so well documented that it started a ball rolling in terms of awareness. That ball bumped up against something that was already happening in California, which was the pressure um, to change this standard called Technical Bullet 117 that insists that all these chemicals are in our furniture. It had been on the books for 38 years with no revision. And um, luckily, uh, Governor Jerry Brown and his administration, they had the ability to sidestep the log jams that were happening in Sacramento. And by administrative order, insist that this technical bulletin be revised so that we don't have to have these chemicals, flame retardants in our furniture. So while we were making the film, this all went down and we got to witness, you know, there, there's still some good people out there. Wow. There's great journalism, there's great citizen action, there's, there's great leaders politically, and this is, a, this is a positive story. So in 2014, and certainly by 2015, when you go to buy a new couch, um, if we've done our job creating awareness, you'll go in and say, you know what, I don't want the one right, with right. the chemicals. Give me the other one. So you have an iPhone app where you can scan, you know, what the retardants <laughs> are in this, like an organic food, yeah. and, you know, what's really here behind the scenes. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, there's so much cancer in the world, too, and you can yeah. start to wonder where's the cancer really coming from? Yeah. You yeah. know, and Parkinson's and all these diseases. So. Definitely. I mean, again, it gets back to the interplay between your genetics and your environment. And um, right. we'll figure it out at some point. We're getting there. Thank I'm, you so yeah. much for doing this. I have <laughs> one more thing I want to talk to you about. Um, let's see. What's olives and dirty martinis? Oh. <laughs> we're going to go there, huh? Yeah, we're going to go there. All Why right. not? <laughs> All right. So uh, you have a band. <laughs> I do. With a I brain do. scientist, brain surgeon, I think, and you know, <laughs> tell me a little bit about it. There's a, there's a part of you that you know, there's the artist, and yeah. you know, that's the other part of you that I wanted to share with our audience. Well, um, let's keep it in perspective. This is a bunch of friends um, that are all musicians that love to play, and played in our youth, and uh, have a real passion for playing rock and roll. So we put together a cover band. Uh, that covers mostly 60s and 70s, some 80s tunes. And uh, it's called Olive and the Dirty Martinis. And our lead singer is Stephanie Coyote, former film She's commissioner. She's got a great voice. She's I amazing. I listened on uh, YouTube. And, um, and so she's our, our, she takes the brunt up at the, on the mic. And then the rest of us are an assorted group of uh, friends. And, and we all in, have our own lives going on outside the band and very involved in other things. But something we really enjoy, we come together once a week to practice and enjoy being together and we play out about once or twice a month at clubs and we'll do fundraisers and you know you want to hire us <laughs> or you can be on my tv show yeah yeah sure so do you practice yes. every night yes do you play every you i do play i can't keep my hands off any well that's guitars great around you want to pick one up now no no okay <laughs> we'll <laughs> have you pressure. on my show and then i'll show off yeah that way. let's let's leave yeah. it at that okay. give me a moment to collect myself <laughs> We'll play live. A couple of rehearsals. I don't blame you. And if you told me to dance right now, I would not do it. Anyway, this is really great. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audiences? Um, I would probably take the chance to mention that one of the other things I'm working on right now is helping reconnect the Colorado River to the ocean. Um, I have a project called Watershed through the Redford Center that's a nonprofit film company that I'm involved with as well. But the core issue is in 1922, um, there is a compact between seven western states and the northern state of, of, in Mexico to divvy up the river. 
-hmm. You get this, we get that, you get this, we get that. And for the first, um, you know, 80, 70 years, it wasn't an issue because no one was fully exercising their, their legal rights. But as the, the population in the West has gone from 2 million to 20 million in the last 50 years. So they're still going on the old, old, old laws? From 1922. Wow. And so everything's changed population-wise and transportation-wise and usage-wise and industry-wise. Totally. More water, more water, more mm -hmm. water. The supply, if anything, has dwindled because of um, climate change. So we have an issue there and it's manifest itself in Mexico because since the late 90s the river has no longer flowed to the ocean and what used to be one of North America's most impressive and important wetlands for migratory routes for birds and there was a local economy and a local Native American community down there um, it just went away it just vanished and, and it's a desert now 10 million dollars would create enough water to restore the wetlands and you know double that and you have a river going into the ocean again well, um, if you think people, about $20 million, million dollars to solve an environmental problem you can see from the space shuttle, I think we can get there. I think so, too. So, you know, Watershed is a film. It's been in 40 film festivals, and there's been 200 community screenings, and we're working with a host of other nonprofits to activate the public to raise this money. And I think it's going to take, you know, organizations like the Nature Conservancy, Environmental Defense Fund, Sonoran Institute, the Mexican one, Pro Natura Noreste, um, other media organizations like Participant Media, we're all working together uh, to raise the money. And I think we're going to get there, and we're focusing particularly on making sure that the public knows that there's a problem, but also that we're going to fix it. But RaiseTheRiver.org is a great place to go and look at this if you want. If you care to watch us, we're going to be successful. Mm, that's and so, great. Another yeah. great cause. Thanks.